Hello, welcome to Old and New. Hi, Hallie, great to see you. Hey, how are you doing? Doing well, what are we talking about on this I, episode? You know, I'm looking forward to this one. It's about caregiving, and a lot is going on with caregiving now. Um, it's just a big topic. And in fact, you know, Joanne Jenkins, who's the president of AARP, sometimes called ARP, sometimes called AARP, has written this new book that's called Disrupt Aging. It just came out, and it's got a lot to say about really innovation and caregiving. So what you think of as caregiving and how it's changing, she's got a lot to say on that. And you know what Rosalind Carter said about caregiving? Well, yeah. She said there's four kinds of people <laughs> in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those will need caregivers. That's which pretty much covers it and sums it up. So in other words, uh, really, we'll all be giving some level of care, we'll need care, and the real numbers are as many as 44 million American caregivers are currently out there caring for people through dark nights, long days, and it, it's really something. Last year, in fact, um, ARP actually did a joint report with the National Alliance for Caregiving on the whole, uh, the whole landscape of caregiving and how people are meeting those challenges. And it, it, it's really a range of, it could be parents taking care of a small uh, child or a disabled child. It could be uh, the sandwich generation we talk about a lot here, taking care of parents and children. There, there's many variations. So. I know you've got a great guest tonight, and uh, Very tell excited. me, tell me about your guest. So yeah, so tonight we have Amy Goyer, and Amy's AARP's family and caregiving expert. Um, as you know, I was at AARP in April. Was able to meet with a lot of the team down there, and we've had some interesting discussions. Uh, and they've been a great resource of the show. So I think Amy will be really good for this. Um, and then later in the episode, I want to hear more about the book. Yeah. Because that looks pretty cool. I know you, uh, you read it cover to cover several times. And <laughs> let's learn some more about the book, too, later on. I read it in hardcover and on Kindle. <laughs> no, I love this book. It's a great book. So we'll, we'll put a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about, um, some stats and, uh, I guess, highlights from Amy and a book that she's uh, worked on on the website and uh, in the YouTube underneath the, the video when we post this. Um, so without further ado, let's talk to Amy. I'm joined today by Amy Goyer. Amy is AARP's family and caregiving expert. Amy, are you there? I'm here. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I think just to start off, some people might not know. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of what AARP does? Sure. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We have about 38 million members. And the goal of AARP is to help people achieve their own goals and dreams and redefine the way that America looks at aging. We uh, do a lot of work to strengthen communities. We have offices in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And we also advocate for consumers in the marketplace by selecting really high quality products and services to carry the AARP name. Uh, we are a trusted source on information. We have a great website and uh, incredible, actually the world's largest circulating magazine and uh, the AARP magazine and also we have the bulletin. Uh, we, we do a lot of things to uh, just really create a, a positive aging experience for Americans. That's great. That's, that's perfect. How about what, what do you do for AARP? I serve as AARP's family and caregiving expert, and I do a variety of things. Uh, I, I 
write a, a column uh, for the ARP website. I do a lot of media interviews like this. I create videos uh, for AARP on family caregiving. I do a lot of traveling around the country, speaking at events, uh, working with family caregivers. I assist them uh, from the family caregiver point of view in terms of developing products and services and, and resources for caregivers. That's great. And how about uh, on a personal level, I think you have some caregiving experience. Um, would, you, would you share a little bit about that? Yes, actually, I've been a family caregiver my entire adult life, starting with my grandparents. Uh, then my mom had a stroke when she was only 63. My uh, older sister, uh, I was her primary caregiver, and she passed away about a year and a half ago. Hmm. For the past seven years, I've been intensively caregiving for both my parents. I moved from Washington, D.C. out to Phoenix, Arizona to take care of them. My mom passed away two, a little over two years ago. And currently, my dad is 92 years old. He has Alzheimer's disease, and he lives with me there. Wow, that's, that's a lot. So it, it's nice that you can kind of connect the things that you're sharing with people, but also sort of bring it to your own family. So I, I, I guess more general, um, a lot of us are sort of thinking about uh, retirement, and I, I guess that it might be a good time to actually um, think about in terms of preparing for caregiving needs. Um, and initially I was thinking financially, but maybe do you have sort of a, a general mindset that we should think about when uh, we're thinking about caregiving to come? Well, first of all, if you're a caregiver, you may be caring for, it, generally we look at it as people over the age of 18, you're caring for an adult. It may be that you're going to have be in a situation of caring for your spouse or your parents, which uh, I, such as I'm doing, a sibling like I did, your adult children who may have a disability or other issues going on. So you want to think about uh, that in terms of who you're going to be caring for. You also want to prepare for your own future in terms of caregiving and who's going to be taking care of us as we age. Uh, the first thing to think about is how you want to live. So if, for example, I know that as I age, I want to remain active. I want to have a community that I can access and be involved in in activities. Walkability is actually really big to me because I want to be able to walk places. I don't want to have to, you know, if I can't drive, how am I going to get places? So thinking about that sort of thing, um, you want to think about your own health issues. As you're aging, uh, do you have existing health issues that will worsen or do you know how they will progress? Are there family history that, uh, you know, for example, my dad and my grandmother both had Alzheimer's. So I'm going to be thinking about as I age, what if, what if I get that. How do I want to prepare for that in terms of financially, as you say, but also where I live, who can take care of me, all of those sorts of things in need, all the legal issues. You want to make sure you have your uh, advanced directives, your, your wishes. Do you, you know, what kind of care do you want? Um, you want to think about who's going to be caring for you. We know that family caregivers provide the most care for us, and we want to know, do you want to live near family members so that it makes it easier for them to help and support you? And that can be a real decision-making process. Nine out of ten people want to age in their own home. So when you're looking at that, how do I age in my own home but also be near enough to family members that they can provide the sort support that I need? And then when you're looking at that, you also want to think about how the home is designed. I call it smart design. You want it to be help, good for people of all ages. So, uh, for example, a zero threshold entry into your home is good for you if you have trouble with steps. But it's also good if you're pushing a baby carriage or you're, you've got a big dog you're trying to get inside or, you know, all kinds of things like that. So think about smart design in your home. Uh, and then, you know, like you said, finances kind of underlie everything. And, and are you planning for the, the potentialities of what uh, financial needs you may have? That's great. It, it, it's an election year, so I was actually wondering, what is AARP doing at the federal and the state level to help caregivers? <laughs> Right. Well, one, one, there's some really exciting developments in that area. Uh, ARP has been really supportive of the bipartisan group uh, called the uh, ACT Caucus, and that's the Assisting Caregivers Today Caucus. And that's at the federal level. It's a bipartisan group that focuses on really bringing greater visibility to the issues and the needs and the value 
of family caregivers, the challenges that we face, what are what are the opportunities and the things that we can do uh, at a federal level to support family caregivers. Uh, that caucus is really important because they work together to bring this issue into play in the political system. Um, and that was started a little over a year ago. The exciting act that has come out of that is the Recognize, Assist, Include, Support, and Engage, that's it's RAISE, R-A-I-S-E, Family Caregivers Act. And this act would, uh, would create a national strategy to support family caregivers. And we think that's really important because family caregivers are... Um, the backbone of the long-term care system in this country. There are 40 million family caregivers in the U.S. So you think about that. Family caregiving affects everyone. Either you have been a caregiver, you are one, you're going to be one, or you're going to be the recipient of care. So we need to look at um, supporting them and a national strategy on that communities would look at, um, service providers, government officials, employers, everyone would sort of recognize and find ways to support family caregivers. So those are two really important things and uh, really great steps forward at the federal level. At the state level, we have um, worked really hard and all of our state offices, huge kudos to them, uh, to create what they call the CARE Act. Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act. Now, this act uh, works, it, it's sort of just a common sense solution that supports family caregivers um, so that when you have loved ones that go in the hospital and then they transition to home, the act requires hospitals to do certain things, um, provide patients with the opportunity to designate a family caregiver. You know, if you have a, a loved one in a hospital, we need to know, you know, what they're doing and that, that we as caregivers can access information. Uh, notify the family caregiver if the loved one has been discharged or transferred. Believe it or not, it happens that someone's discharged, goes home, and the family caregiver doesn't even know this has happened. And then it also provides an opportunity for family caregivers to and the patient to ask questions, to get training about aftercare and medical care at home. So these are all things that we really want uh, all the politicians to be talking about and thinking about. That's great. Um, if you could sort of wave your magic wand, is there one thing you could change immediately about caregiving? You know, I think I would really want family caregivers to feel more supported. We have to be doing this. There are going to be fewer family caregivers in the future for every older person who needs care. So we're, we're going to be even more stressed and pressed than we really are already. And, and believe me, family caregivers, uh, I can say that our, we're, we're really uh, very stressed. And I want family caregivers to feel um, the support of the community. I want there to be more community-based services that can help, including respite care. You know, you, you, you can't imagine what this is like and how exhausting it is and how difficult it really is to get support. So I, I just want family caregivers to feel they can take on this role, which is highly needed, and they can do it with confidence and feel that they're going to be able to manage it and have the support they need. That's great. You mentioned uh, the, the website earlier and some of the videos, but maybe you can talk a little bit more of that. Uh, we should sort of wrap up here. What, what are the resources uh, that AARP offers for people dealing with caregiving issues? AARP has an online caregiving resource center that's just fabulous. Everything from information about planning for caregiving to how to deal with benefits, insurance, legal issues, managing finances, how to actually provide the care, the hands-on care, um, senior housing options, dealing with end of life, which is a really difficult issue, and, and, and even a life after caregiving. We have an online community, so if you can't make it to a local support group, you may be able to connect with other caregivers in our online community group. And that's really important because we really learn the most from each other. I have a new book out called Juggling Life, Work, and Caregiving that AARP and the American Bar Association have published, and I cover all of these issues in the book and more. Um, another neat thing that people can do that's new is you can text 97779, that's 97779, and you can text Amy and in the body of the text, and then you'll opt in for text messages. So I write up text messages with tips and links and inspiration for caregivers. You'll get about four a month. 
We have a free publication called Prepare to Care, and that is a real good kind of basic planning publication that you can use. And then, of course, all those state offices I mentioned are engaged in, uh, have, in local events, caregiving workshops and seminars and conferences and that sort of thing. That's, that's great. I, I really appreciate you sharing those and uh, all the hard work you're doing and with your team. Um, you know, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling encouraged just by our conversation. Um, Wonderful. It, it, it's, a, it's a challenge for a lot of us, but yeah, it, it's nice to have the backup. So um, yeah. thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate you joining us today on Old and New. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So Hallie, I want to hear more about this book, Disrupt Aging by Joanne Jenkins. I know you read it. Uh, you told us you got it on Kindle, hard copy. Uh, who's the audience for the book? The audience, when you would pick it up in a store and you'd see it's about aging. You think, well, it's for, you know, people over 50, whatever. And it certainly is, but it's so much broader an audience. It's a conversation. After you read this, you're going to want to talk with your family. You're going to want to talk with, if you've got college kids, where they want to live, where you want to live. A lot of how you will live is addressed in this as you age. And in many ways, I think that's a family decision. It's, it's an amazing, comprehensive point of view on how you can make your life as a person aging, an older person, um, better, but also how that will affect your family. And it's just, it is mind boggling and inspiring how she makes you think about aging she doesn't want you to think about aging as getting closer to death. She thinks this generation is all about vitality and living in a vital, lively way and helping earlier generations to reach their goals. And that vitality moves towards a time when, yes, we die. But the idea of retirement before this has been that you're just going to get more and more playing a golf game one week and then playing once a month and then maybe playing once a year and this sense of just falling off and she's like that's not what this generation's going to do it's going to change retirement even the word she rarely uses retirement because she has a whole new way of thinking about it great uh, it's a lot to cover. Uh, how did she organize the book? What, what, how were those topics broken down into something that's a little more manageable? Well, I'm going to quick. I'm going to give you the contents. It'll it'll give you an idea. But each one, it's more than even the title. So I'll tell you some of the ones I like the best and why the title sounds good. But it's so much more. So obviously she's got an introduction to why she even wrote this book called Why Disrupt Aging. It was her 50th birthday party. Everybody gives her cards. This is, well, you know, you're almost over the hill. You're this. So, they were so down. Age, age specific and making fun of her. Yes, almost. and yeah. so down and depressing. She's like, wait, this is ridiculous. We could do better than this. Uh, the New Reality of Aging is chapter one. Own Your Age is chapter two. Chapter three, design your life. Make a life that works for you. Chapter four, take control of your health. Uh, no surprise to us at Old and New, how healthy you are is gonna determine so many things, about 50 to 100, as we like to say. Uh, chapter five, choose where you live. Now, I have to admit, I got crazy with this chapter because on the AARP website, you have this index that talks about how walkable your neighborhood is. And we have a good number, 02476, where we do our show. It's, it's a really big number. Good we have hear. great mass transit. You can get to a doctor. You can get to see people. You can see your friends. So it's not how much you might be. It's not that you're literally walking a lot, but it's that you are connecting to other people, which is so important, and, and health care and all that. Um, chapter six, that bugaboo of uh, retirement and aging, finance your future. She talks about a whole new way to think of money. And it's not going to be, I'm not going to work anymore. You're going to figure out many ways to work and earn and learn. She combines it in a way that's very exciting. Chapter seven, put your experience to work. 
we've got a lot of older people that are very wise and have some good ideas that can help younger people do business. And she talks about that. Chapter eight, let's change the rules. Yeah, I love that. I'll tell you more later. And chapter nine, a new vision for living and aging in America. America is not very well set up for aging. We created suburbs that are totally car dependent. Mm -hmm. Everything that's not good in terms of green is also not so good in terms of aging and keeping us young and fresh, us, us sprouts. We're not so green. If you have to take a car everywhere, it's going to be hard as you're 70, 80, 90, whatever. So she's got a lot on that subject. It's very timely. It's, it's really, I'm gushing. I yeah, know. No, I'm, I'm sorry. But it, it's really good. Well, it's obvious you loved it. Um, have you been able to take things from the book immediately and sort of change your life around them? Yeah. I, th I think in particular her idea that it's not about decline, that aging is about, uh, in a way, you're rearranging. What are the things I'm good at? What are the things I love to do? What are the things I can offer? I, we did, I think I sent a, a piece that I saw in the paper for our website, Old and New, on Facebook, about Harvard Business School is bringing back many people who were CEOs or leaders in their companies. They were doing, you know, they might have been selling popsicle sticks or whatever. They yeah. were doing work. They did very well. They made money. But now they're calling them to the carpet of saying, you know how to run an organization. Get out there and do something that will really help people. For instance, there was a piece that um, it was actually on PBS about the person who had been in charge of Trader Joe's and doing great work for them and making money for them. He's now started a, a food bank type grocery store in Dorchester, I think, and he has created a way to use a lot of food that gets wasted from hotels and restaurants. Yep. Have you heard about yep. that? And he has taken all that expertise. He spent a lifetime learning and gaining and he is, I believe in his 70s or 80s, runs this new company as teaching people how to do that. So I, I agree, Harvard Business School should get everybody back in there and think how can we, how can we really uh, use those, those skills we have. So that and together, first of all, the ARP website has so much yeah, fun I was gonna ask stuff. Those, yeah, the, <laughs> and how it pairs up with some of the stuff you've seen on the it, website. It, it does because they have a lot of quizzes. A lot of sites on the web, you know, have these quizzes, and you're trying to figure out: Do I know, you know, enough science that I'm equal with a fifth grader in my house or whatever? And a lot of these on the ARP site make you think about very different ways of living and working. Of course, the other thing I love, which is what we've been talking about, and we do, is really this gig economy that kids that were 20 are inventing right is really succeeding with people over 50 mm. 60 70 if you are using mm. uh you know you can be a driver part of the day for lyft or uber you can rent part of your house for with airbnb you can create money she believes that Retirement is out in terms of don't stop working. It's very healthy to keep working, yep. and it's very important financially because we're all having a strain. So now, if you have no money to retire on, don't worry because you should be working. <laughs> you don't have to be embarrassed about working until you're very old anymore because you should be working. It's good for your Some health. Level, yep. So she, uh, she ends the book with, um, or I could keep going on. I really, it's just pretty exciting. She ends the book with the idea of aging has four freedoms. And okay. her freedoms, she admits, it came from um, something that FDR said about the freedom uh, to worship, the freedom of speech, freedom of, from want, and freedom from fear when he was in office. Um, this was in 1941, he made that speech. So she believes the freedoms are the freedom to choose how and where you want to live, with all those things we talk about, is your house on the first floor? Can you get in easily? Can you, all that. Sure. Um, the freedom to earn. She believes you should keep earning, both because you need and will want the money, um, and also you're connecting with people, and you're getting up and washing your face and putting your clothes on and getting out the door every morning. It's very healthy. It's one of the biggest factors of longevity, she talks about. Um, freedom to earn, freedom oh. to learn, she says we have to keep learning, not just keep up with technology, but 
many people are going to choose to live in college towns, for instance, and keep doing class and keep learning things. Again, it's a way to connect with people where you can share your wisdom. You know? And then her fourth freedom, freedom to pursue happiness. And you spend so much of your young life thinking, oh, mom and dad want me to be a lawyer, so I'll do that. And you find out you don't even like it. And you know at a certain point, it's maybe the 50th birthday cake sitting there or later, that you go, you know, nobody cares what I do, but I do, sure. and I want to do, I want to have the freedom to find what makes me happy. And so she's quite a supporter of that. And it surprises you when you make those choices, right? I mean, I think we both know yeah. we've made those kinds of choices. So uh, it's a pretty inspirational book. Sounds like it. <laughs> I got to say. And um, it's better in Kindle because I can search it. Yeah. <laughs> and share. You've shared and some of the share, stuff from it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think it's it's really a great book. I love it. You want to hold it up one more time? Yeah, so, uh, sure. I've got all my little stickies in it. There it is. Disrupt Aging. And she talks about how she ended up at ARP at a time she thought she'd retire. They offered her the job, and she's like, I don't need that job. I can retire. Yeah. Bad idea. She's like, it was the smartest thing ever. A bunch of her friends said, go, go, go do that and see what happens. And she said, it was, it's been life changing for her. So it's, she's great. All right. Well, we'll put the link on the website <laughs> and, uh, you know, you might have to share that with some of the, the your co host and crew. So. I'm not sharing this. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't have it. No. Whatever. I have it digitally, so it's all good. Disrupt Aging, Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP. That's great. Howie, thanks for the book review. Anytime, Adam. We've been editing this episode about caregiving, and I have some takeaways. Number one takeaway that I learned as I'm listening to the caregiving expert, Amy Goyer from ARP, is that she had not anticipated her mother, for instance, getting sick very young, having a stroke at 63 and needing full care. Many times with caregiving, it'll just come out of the blue. So if you can possibly have that after dinner conversation with family and make a plan, what would we do if somebody needs care in our family? And don't be fooled thinking it would only be a senior. It may be that seniors need to care for a younger family member. So you need to consider all options. I think it's worth having that difficult conversation. Second thing, it's clear from the ARP website, they have a ton of resources for caregivers. They keep you up to date on legislation, they are going to give you connection to community of people who've gone through it. They just have the latest on this subject, and it's a great place to go. So they also let you win free gifts if you answer quizzes on caregiving properly, so don't miss it. And then my third takeaway really is don't go it alone. Don't be on your own and not connected with family, friends, community in a larger and larger circle with people who have gone through this and can give you such useful information. Caregiving is difficult, but we can hopefully help you make it easier. So check out all those resources. Thanks for watching.